Oh, thank you, Kat. You've started the recording for me. I'm always very wary about not recording. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. So thank you for joining us for this webinar. Uh, quite an exciting webinar. We've got uh, Unicore in here to talk about their um, developments in HD research. And giving the talk, we've got uh, Joseph Higgins, uh, VP of Clinical Development for Huntington Disease at Unicure. We're very thankful to have Joseph here with us. And um, take it away. So the um, the structure will be that Joe, you will have you will have the floor. You can do your uh, slides and your presentation. Uh, and then if anyone has any questions, you can ask them along the way um, by using the chat box. Um, and then we'll have some questions at the end if anyone does. Okay. Super. Okay. Well, thank you, Joe. Welcome. So we are. Good everyone and good day. Um, I'm Dr. Joe Higgins. I'm the Vice President of Clinical Development here at Unicure. And it's an honor to be able to present our data uh, to the Huntington Disease Youth Organization. Um, the next slide is really a, a disclaimer, uh, and it's about forward looking statements. Uh, I will use words such as anticipate, believe, could, estimate, expect, goal, intend, look forward to, may, plan, potential, predict, project, should, will, and just. Um, Th those are forward-looking statements, and as you know, we received FDA approval uh, for this clinical trial on January 18th of this year, so we haven't, we haven't begun the trial. So most of the data that you will see here are really based on our non-clinical or preclinical data. So to familiarize yourself with Unicure, uh, Unicure was founded in the Netherlands in 1998, and you'll see the term AMT a, a lot. And AMT is, um, stands for Amsterdam Molecular Therapeutics. So that's how Unicure started. And, but it was listed on the NASDAQ exchange as publicly traded on February 5, 2014. Uh, Unicure has about 200 employees in both Amsterdam and Lexington, Massachusetts. Uh, the CEO is Matt Capista. And here you see in the slide our mission. Our mission really is to deliver curative one-time therapies that transform the lives of patients. Um, so as you know, uh, gene therapy is a one-time administration, and so there's no repeated injections or uh, taking multiple pills over your lifetime. Just to give you some familiarity of what uh, Unicure does, uh, we work on several gene therapies, including liver-directed therapies, as well as uh, CNS diseases. Uh, hemophilia B, we're in the pivotal phase three phase and having good results in having in restoring factor nine activity uh, to patients with this bleeding disorder. Hemophilia A, Fabre disease, and other liver directed targets are in uh, preclinical development. In our CNS space, we're working on Huntington's disease, and my hope um, for the pipeline is really to capitalize on a platform called MyCure Therapy, which is a silencing, gene silencing therapy using microRNA. Uh, Huntington disease, or AMT-130 is the drug product, uh, is now uh, entering the phase one, phase two clinical trial. In Lexington, we have a large scale manufacturing facility. Um, it's state of the art. Uh, it's something to remember that not only is the gene therapy protocol, clinical trial protocol important, but also the, the ability to escalate the production of the drug. Um, what our facility does is uses insect cells and baclovirus, which is a common form of virus found in invertebrates. Uh, we really worked hard to get this insect baculovirus manufacturing system down pat. Uh, we've established it for over a decade, worked out the kinks, and we have a very strong uh, uh, ability to uh, manufacture um, any sort of uh, AAV-based uh, therapy. The facility is located in Lexington, Massachusetts. It's uh, 88,000 square feet, which is uh, very large. Um, what's important to note is that we're able to uh, scale up fairly quickly and have a really high volume capacity as well as a consistent, stable, high quality uh, manufacturing under um, good manufacturing practices. Practices. So what is AAV5? So AAV5 is not a virus. 
Okay, it's a vector. So it's adeno-associated virus. This happens to be called serotype 5. Uh, what's important about AAV5 is that it has, uh, we have a lot of studies, both long-term follow-up, demonstrating the safety and tolerability of this vector. Uh, 25 patients across four clinical studies, including hemophilia B, San Filippo B, and acute intermittent porphyria. Uh, San Filippo B was injected into the brains of uh, children and found to uh, be well tolerated. Another important aspect as far as the central nervous system is that there's a low avidity for pre-existing neutralizing antibodies, as well as a favorable immunodicity profile uh, for systemic intravenous delivery. And importantly, there's no T-cell mediated immune response. So what does that mean? That means that AAV5 would be a terrible vaccine. So you don't build up long-term immunity to this vector. Uh, and that's important for a couple of reasons in the CNS is that as many people know, multiple sclerosis may be a T-cell mediated, mediated response. So the possibility of these long-term uh, immunological reactions to the vector are not existent for AAV5. So as you see, I have your AMT-130. As I mentioned in the beginning, that stands for Amsterdam Medical Technology. It's compound 130 or vector 130. So what we've done uh, to the uh, AAV5 vector is that this is a recombinant vector, and we engineered a microRNA to target the Huntington messenger RNA. So this is non-allele specific, meaning that we target both the mutant and wild type RNA. Uh, it's synthesized and cloned in an expression set with a uh, promoter, as you see here, that, that uh, drives the expression of the microRNA. Um, the technology also involves um, a proprietary sequence, which really what it does, it, it processes the microRNA into the active guide strand uh, without any complementary passenger strand. And the passenger strand is the, is the strand that causes what they call off-target effects, which means that it cuts down or eliminates the possibility of adverse effects due to genetic uh, issues. Another important aspect of AMT-130 is that it targets not only the full-length production of the full-length mutant protein, but also targets the exon-1 Huntington protein, which is thought to be, uh, particularly by Dr. Jill Bates, to be one of the primary culprits of the neuropathology of Huntington's. So this exon-1 protein is highly toxic, uh, and as the number of repeats increase, this highly toxic protein is produced more which may explain why there's an earlier onset uh, of Huntington's disease when individuals have a high number of CAG repeat lengths. So with AMT-130, it targets both the full-length uh, mutant Huntington protein as well as the small, highly toxic exon-1 protein fragment. So how do we deliver uh, and why do we deliver uh, AMT-130 to the brain? Well, we do know from... Uh, old-time pathological studies and also with newer imaging techniques that, as you see here, uh, labeled number one, this is called the striatum, which is the caudate and putamen uh, nuclei combined. And we know the striatum is the primary site of the neuropathology. So the Huntington protein seems to destroy the medium spine neurons, which are in those structures. And then with time, it appears that the atrophy spreads and causes cortical thinning and atrophy. Uh, the motor symptoms also progress as the atrophy increases, and that's a combination of both striatal atrophy as well as somatomotor cortex atrophy and frontal lobe atrophy. So one of the reasons why we deliver AMT-130 directly to the structures, particularly the caudate and putamen, is because that is where the disease uh, begins. So here is a picture of a non-human primate brain. Uh, and we look at the distribution of AMT-130 after direct injection. And here you see uh, in, in dark color uh, the expression of the vector, both in the caudate putamen, and you can also see it's uh, spread to the cortex. Uh, and that's important because we do know that AMT-130, once it injects the uh, microRNA into the cell, it integrates into the nucleus, uh, where, it, where, where it becomes episomal, 
And this episome then travels by retrograde as well as antegrade transport, meaning up and down, both to the cortex and to the deeper gray matter structures by extravesicular uh, transport. Uh, we've also tested AMP-130 in uh, pigs. These are large animals with a lifespan of about 20 years. They're approximately 200 pounds or 140 kilograms or 100 to 100, 50 to 140 kilograms. Their brain weight is approximately 100 grams. They have a highly developed immunological system, uh, very similar to human beings. So the immunological aspects of injection are, are very comparable to human beings. So as you see on the right, uh, with mutant pro Huntington protein knockdown, you see that when we inject directly into the caudate putamen, you see quite a bit of lowering at six months and 12 months in the striatum, as well as lowering the cortex. Here you see approximately a 75% uh, lowering in the deep gray matter structures, the caudate and putamen, with a about 75% reduction. Uh, no, 25%, I'm sorry, 75% in the caudate and putamen with a 25 uh, to 50% reduction in the uh, cortex. So how do we inject uh, AMT-130? We use stereotactic surgery. So stereotactic surgery really is about getting three different coordinates to target these structures in three dimensions. Um, we use real-time MRI guidance, meaning that the patient is in an MRI, in this particular case, the monkey uh, brain uh, is being visualized was in this MRI bore. And we use this technique called convection-enhanced delivery using a micro-step cannula. So this microstep cannula um, is very small, and it tapers to the size of a human hair, uh, which, it, which is about um, 0.2 millimeters. And with that catheter, we slowly inject AMT-130 over a period of several hours at a very slow rate under positive pressure. And what that does is that it uh, slowly increases the space between the neurons without causing any uh, what they call edema. And by that cell process, the AAV5 comes in contact with the neuronal surface, sticks to it, and then delivers the, uh, the payload or the microRNA. This is done in a very slow way so that uh, there is no uh, tissue damage. And the reason why we know there's no tissue damage, because in the monkey studies, what we performed, we didn't see any signs of any uh, neural damage. So this is a movie I'm going to show you of how this is, um, this is, this is done. You okay there, Joe? Got on mute. Joe, still there? There he is. You back, Joe? Oh, can you hear me now? Yep, yeah, we can. Okay. Well, welcome back. Yeah, what happened was during the video, uh, it automatically put uh, me on mute. Uh, so that videotape um, shows the procedure for injecting. And what we're going to do is, as you see from the video, is that you inject into the head of the caudate and then twice into the putamen. And by that positive pressure, it starts filling up the structure. And then by anterograde and retrograde transport, travels to other parts of the brain. Um, so this slide here is what I, uh, I mentioned, no one heard me, <laughs> but I mentioned that uh, this convection-enhanced delivery system slowly 
expands these spaces between neurons without causing any uh, neuronal damage. And we know that because we did the uh, neuropathological studies on uh, monkeys. And here you see an MRI of a monkey where you see a tiny dot. Uh, can you see my arrow? No, you can't. Okay. No, you can't. Deep in the brain, you'll see a small dot, and that's where the catheter was inserted, and that's on a T1-weighted image to the left. On the right is a T2-weighted image where you see a small area of increased hyperintensity. Um, and then on the far uh, right, you see the neuropathology where you don't see any um, injury into the cauda entertainment, but you see this small, tiny hole. Now, that may look big, uh, but that's about smaller than a capillary. It's, it's very, very tiny. Um, and th this is something that you see uh, with any brain injection. And in fact, deep brain stimulation, that hole is much, much bigger. And we do know from that procedure at th that there's really uh, no uh, brain injury due to the uh, insertion of that uh, electrode. So the MRIs were actually unremarkable in the vast majority of non-human primates. I showed you on the MRI and histopathology uh, some of the monk this is one of the monkeys that actually did have something on MRI that we could see. And when you really look at the pathology, you'll see a little bit of um, what they call granulomatous inflammation at the site of the injection. And that included not only uh, monkeys that were injected with AMT-130, but also monkeys that were injected with just plain old uh, saline or the vehicle alone. Uh, this is not an unexpected uh, from uh, inserting a catheter uh, or a cannula into the brain. When you look at how long this, the uh, microhunting tin persists, you can see here and, um, that the microhunting tin persists for up to about six months, independent of the dose that we give. We do know from other studies um, in, in humans, not a San Filippo B in particular, that we now have expression out to about uh, four to five years. So we expect that this uh, injection will last at least that long, uh, if not a lifetime. So you see from this graph that we've used uh, different doses. Um, in the clinical trials, I explain, explain later that uh, we'll be uh, using two different doses, both um, designed to give the possibility of a phenotypic or a clinical response. So this MyCure my um, platform using microRNA can be applied not only to Huntington's, but also other diseases that have a CAG trinucleotide repeat. So to date, I'll just briefly go over here some of the uh, preclinical uh, preclinical efficacy, safety, some of the pharmacology and immunogenicity studies that are performed with AMT-130. It's important to note that this is non-allele selective, uh, that we are planning to knock down both wild type as well as mutant Huntington. We do know from animal studies that knocking out uh, the Huntington gene in early development can cause brain problems. However, in adult animals, that has not been found the case. So we, we believe that this is going to be safe. And in fact, with other clinical trials using ASO, it appears that knocking down um, the mutant Huntington protein in individual hunting disease has not caused any untoward uh, effects. So preclinical pre safety studies that were performed in non-human primates, it was also performed in all the transgenic animal models, including uh, the really aggressive R62 animal model, where we found increased uh, survival as well as uh, reversal of the neuropathology in that mouse. We also have MRS data in the, uh, in the Q175 mouse, which shows a restoration of neuronal function, at least in the epitamin in those mouse mice. Um, so we do know that there's long-lasting lowering after a single administration of AMT-130. Uh, and the CSF reflects Huntington protein lowering in the pig model uh, when correlated with both striatal and cortical lowering of mutant Huntington protein. We show that um, we also did selective versus non-selective allele uh, studies, and we found that the non-allele specific uh, approach really is more effective than the, the allele specific approach. Uh, we really could not identify a micro Huntington uh, that would effectively lower it to levels where we, where we felt would be uh, clinically uh, meaningful. 
The pharmacology, we do know that lowering of the Huntington protein, the striatum and cortex is safe uh, in large and small transgenic Huntington models, including uh, normal non-human primates. And we do know that the serum neutralizing antibodies in, as far as AAV5 do not limit the initial intraparenchymal brain administration. So we've been not, we have not been uh, able to identify any CSF neutralizing antibodies uh, in the animal models. So what's the goal of the treatment? Well, here you see a graph showing uh, what happens in hunting disease in people. There's a pre-symptomatic stage, a prodromal stage, which we call the pre-manifest uh, condition. Then at the time of motor diagnosis, um, patients enter the early stages of hunting disease, in which the early phase, there's stage one and stage two, and that's based on uh, total functional capacity. And as you advance to stage three, four, and five, uh, the disease progresses. So we're hoping that AMT-130, by lowering mutant Huntington protein in the brain, uh, will slow or even halt disease progression in those individuals who are uh, called manifest. So here's the considerations for the phase one, uh, two dose escalation study. So we are going to enroll early manifest stage one, that should be stage one and two patients. Um, we're, we're going to select for individuals with a high number of CAG repeats that's based on the fact that individuals with a high number of repeats have a higher, uh, have a more rapid decline in caudate atrophy on MRI. We believe that also reflects, will be reflective in the mutant Huntington in the CSF. And we hope that uh, enrolling that select group of patients will give us an answer more readily than if we opened it up to more patients. We plan on using three surgical sites in the United States. Uh, these neurosurgeons uh, are top-notch. They have experience in convection hands delivery uh, at least a decade each. Uh, they are part of the original teams that developed this technique uh, at NIH under Dr. Ed Ofield. And so we believe that these neurosurgeons are the best in the world. Not only that, uh, very few surgical techniques have been performed on patients with Huntington's. So we recruited Dr. Jan Vesper from Dusseldorf University and he um, has placed deep brain electrodes in many Huntington's patients, so he knows the neuroanatomy well. In fact, him and our neurosurgeons got together and by virtual operations in the cloud, were able to figure out the trajectories, potential trajectories of early manifest patients, and that's the way the uh, neurosurgical approach was developed. And we're going to use an anterior approach on the top of the head uh, and inject once in the caudate and twice in the epitamen on each side. We're going to have at least three non-surgical sites at Huntington Disease Centers of Excellence, where we have experts in Huntington Disease that can do all of the uh, studies that we plan on collecting throughout the course of the study, after, both before and after uh, administration of AMT-130. It's going to be a randomized, double-armed, blind study with an imitation surgery control the imitation surgery control is really about the efficacy portion of this trial. This is a phase one, two dose escalation study, meaning phase one is really about safety. Phase two is about efficacy. We do expect to see lowering of mutant uh, Huntington, the CSF, as well as some other clinical changes uh, with this lowering because we, we did see the same thing in transgenic uh, animals. So we believe that we've designed this with the maximum uh, benefit for all patients in seeing a clinical response so that we can quickly go to a, a pivotal uh, trial. So this was discussed with the FDA and they felt that the uh, clinical trial design was um, appropriate for um, the risk that we're putting patients through. So over the time period of the study after injection, we'll be measuring CSF mutant Huntington protein uh, micro Huntington, which would be our pharmacokinetic measurement, as well as other biomarkers, particularly neurofilament light protein in the CSF, as well as other biomarkers in the uh, patient serum. We'll measure that over a, a period of nine to 18 months. And then we have other exploratory endpoints uh, that will be uh, 
looking at. So here's some of the other, uh, here's kind of the study design at a high level. Uh, Huntington patients will be invited to join at each center. Uh, there'll be a screening uh, process where people will have to meet eligibility criteria. Some of the eligibility criteria I didn't mention before is that um, the screening will involve mainly looking at not only the CG trinucleotide repeat number, but also looking at striatal volume. Uh, the striatal volume has to meet a certain criteria. We don't expect that's going to be an issue, but we want to make sure that when we inject into the caudate putamen that we fill enough of the structure up to um, transduce enough neurons. So there'll be several measurements over a period of uh, 9 to 18 months, and you see here in the, the red arrow, there'll be baseline two weeks, one month, three, six, nine, 12, 15, and 18 months. And CSF levels of uh, different metabolites, including mutant, mutant Huntington protein, um, micro, micro Huntington RNA, as well as NFL um, and other safety parameters, uh, including cytokines, uh, CSF cell count, uh, uh, et cetera, will be measured in the CSF on a serial basis. Joe? Yes. So, uh, we have a question from Hannah. So Hannah's asking, uh, can you say more about the other biomarkers and exploratory endpoints that they will be collecting? Yes. So on the right part of the side, um, we'll be collecting in five major categories, clinical parameters, quantitative motor function, volumetric MRI and MRS, uh, biomarkers neuronal injury, including neurofilament light, as well as mutant uh, uh, Huntington. And then we have a series of patient report outcomes that we'll be collecting. The clinical parameters, the unified Huntington disease rating scale. Uh, of course, we're going to be collecting both composite scores, as well as total functional capacity, total motor score, et cetera. Quantitative motor functioning, uh, we'll be looking at uh, a quantitative motor functions. Uh, Ralph Reilman has pioneered this technique and is using several clinical trials. Every, every site will be uh, qualified to administer that test and certified by Ralph. Uh, Ralph Reilman actually is the uh, chairman of the uh, steering committee, so he'll be active in the trial. The volumetric MRI and MRS will be, very, will be identical to what's going on in the um, Enroll HD study and uh, track on. Um, so we, we're working with the same vendor that has conducted those studies, and uh, we've standardized the MRI and MRS procedure according to a standardized uh, protocol. The biomarkers and neural injury, as mentioned before, mutant Huntington CSF protein will be done in a, in a standardized fashion, uh, the way it's done in other clinical trials. Uh, and the NFL would be done on a, uh, on a, in a standardized way. Uh, by a company that is about to uh, put the, these biomarkers uh, into the commercial arena. The patient report outcomes, we work closely with Ju uh, Julie Stout, not only on the uh, HD cab, but also in the patient report outcomes, so they also, also will be standardized. Okay, so what are the objectives? Um, and I'm going to mention again the patient efficacy uh, endpoints, which is on the right. But the protocol has been uh, cleared for enrollment. Uh, of course, the objectives for this phase one, two is really about assessing safety, tolerability, and efficacy signals. Uh, it will be designed as a multi center randomized double blinded study. It will be controlled with imitation surgery, uh, two dose cohorts, cohorts with a total of 26 patients. Uh, the two doses, uh, the first dose will be um, what we call low dose. That low dose is predicted to cause a 50% lowering of mutant Huntington the striatum and a 25% lowering the cortex. That degree of lowering actually has been shown uh, to ameliorate and, and reverse the symptoms in transgenic animal models of Huntington's. So we believe even a low dose should have some therapeutic efficacy. And then the second dose, the high dose, which is uh, predicted to lower mutant Huntington by 75% in the striatum and 50% in the cortex. So those two dose cohorts both are designed with the intent of looking at efficacy signals. Early manifest patients with a greater than equal to 44 CAG repeats. Again, that's really because we wanted to enrich the population and have worked uh, closely with statisticians in trying to figure out, can we enrich the population 
so that if we do see an efficacy signal, that it would be fairly easy to adapt the trial to a pivotal trial. And so that's one of the reasons why we're doing this um, is that there's approximately an 80% statistical power to see a 40% effect, at least in quantitative atrophy, in the way the study is designed. Uh, again, though, however, the, the, the study itself as it sits right now is not designed or powered to actually see that effect. Um, this was really an expectation that there would be uh, some sort of clinical signal. So the total uh, number of months follow-up is 18 months. Um, for treated patients by FDA mandate, uh, we are obliged to follow these patients up for five years on an annual basis, uh, and that will be done as per the FDA protocol. The efficacy endpoints is quite a bit of work for patients. Uh, we do feel that we've minimized the number of tests as much as possible so that we can get this completed in a timely way without causing uh, undue frustration as well as uh, headaches for the patient. Uh, we've heard uh, from our patient advocacy group that one of the, the problems with uh, clinical trials that takes such a long time to gather the data and these patients are exhausted after the evaluation. So we've really focused uh, all of our efficacy endpoints on uh, what we hear from the experts would be the most poignant and the most uh, focused uh, areas to, fo uh, to look at as far as efficacy. Joe, I have a quick question. Sure. Um, with the greater than 44 repeats, are you going to be considering um, possible juvenile onset patients for this? Yeah, so what we've um, limited the age to 25 to 65. And it, yeah, the age 25 is really based on brain development. There's some studies that show your brain isn't really fully developed till you're 25, although I think that could be older <laughs> in some people. Uh, but I, I think that that's the reason, because if, if you knock out mutant hunting tin too much, um, there could be some brain developmental effects, at least um, by the data that's available in, in uh, transgenic mouse models. Does that answer your question? It really does. Thank you. Okay, sure. So when we start thinking about executing uh, the clinical trial and what would be the, the end game here, um, of course, we would like to treat all of Huntington's patients. This is a phase one, two trial, so we really have to be selective so that we can get to the point of making this available to more patients in a timely way. What we plan on doing in the clinical trial, because there is a uh, imitation surgery control, as soon as we go back to the FDA and we see any kind of efficacy signal, we're going to ask the FDA, can we then uh, do an open label extension to start treating the patients that actually have received the imitation uh, control, you know, or, and, you know, that have not received any drug? Uh, so that, that's what our uh, strategy is as far as making this available to more people. Some of the, the highlights of what would a target product profile look like, um, you have to remember this is a one-time administration. This isn't multiple doses over a period of time. Uh, this is one uh, surgical procedure um, and it's done. Um, the other thing about this MyCure silencing platform, um, Unicure has been working on this micro Huntington platform for at least six to seven years. And you've heard Pavlina Konstantikova uh, talk a lot about this in, in many meetings in the hunting disease community. This data is, has been vetted. Um, it's an excellent data. It's been repeated many, many times over in multiple, multiple models. So as a clinician, I feel totally confident on the silencing platform. And I really do believe based on that that data that there is a really good chance that we're going to be able to silence meat hunting tin, uh, not only in the deep gray matter, the caught epitamin, but also with retrograde spread and integrate spread to other gray matter structures. So we do know this strong mutant hunting tin knockdown in both of these deep and, and superficial gray matter. And there's no reason to believe that this not would be, this would not happen in, in people and patients with Huntington's disease. So the preclinical data is, is fairly pristine. Uh, it's uh, safe, well tolerated. We know from the monkey studies, it really is when you look at deep brain stimulation and that pathology that they've had from the early times when the FDA was approving that, that, that 
that technique is that it's almost identical to deep brain stimulation. And we now know after about 15, 20 years of experience with deep brain stimulation is that the long-term side effects of the uh, insertion of that electrode are minimal. Another important point is that uh, AMT-130 is the only gene therapy or ASO out there that actually targets not only the full-length protein, but also the highly toxic exon-1 small protein fragment. And that's a very important uh, thing to remember. Um, it's becoming clear to me, and after reading the literature in more uh, depth, that it's, this is very similar to Alzheimer's disease, where you get different fragments that can, that can cause the pathology. Uh, in Huntington's, this is fairly recent evidence that these small uh, toxic fragments that are found in patients with a mutation may be one of the culprits in determining how severe your disease actually uh, progresses. Well, Huntington's disease, I mean, we do know that the epidemiology is quite a number of people with this disease, um, about three to seven per 100,000 people, which would mean there'd be 30 to 40,000 people in the United States with this disorder. So it's a real unmet uh, medical need to provide treatment for uh, this group of individuals. There are no treatments available. And right now, our near-term goal is really to get this study up and running uh, as soon as possible. So we plan on it, uh, dosing our first patient in the second half of 2020 and enrolling uh, really in the near future. So I'll be glad to take any questions. Uh, hopefully that was helpful. Hi, Joe, it's Kat again. I have another question. Okay. Sure. Um, so my question is that this is going to be quite a highly skilled neuro neurosurgical procedure. Is that going to be easy for neurosurgeons across the world to learn, or is it something that they already know and they just need technique? Yeah, I get asked that question a lot. <laughs> and, you know, being a neurologist myself and working worked with neurosurgeons, particularly in epilepsy, I'm a pediatric neurologist, um, things like um, deep brain stimulation, um, vagus nerve stimulators, um, even the oncology space so with the, the delivery of chemotherapy, those techniques have been around since the early 1990s. And I was fortunate enough to be at NIH in the 1990s and worked with Dr. Ed Oldfield. One of the neurosurgeons, uh, Russ Lons or Ohio State, also did. Uh, Ed Oldfield uh, developed a technique called convection-enhanced delivery, which is highly specialized. Um, he pretty much perfected that technique in the early 1990s. And now with chemotherapy, places like Sloan Kettering and, and different cancer centers are using this technique routinely. This is no different than that, except we're only doing three injections each side of the brain, and we know exactly where we're going, right? And we're, we know the anatomy is fairly consistent from an early manifest hunting disease patients. So yes, there's a lot of experience with the technique. Now, of course, um, in the beginning of phase one, two trial, you want to standardize this. So I am very, very fortunate to have three excellent neurosurgeons. Russ Lonser, who's a friend of mine, Paul Larson at UCSF, uh, and Stan Anderson at, at Johns Hopkins. Stan has done a lot of deep brain stimulation. And the fourth person who's not going to be operating but will be advising is Jan Vesper, who's done literally scores of patients with Huntington's disease and, and inserted electrodes. So an electrode insertion is really no different technique than putting a, a cannula in to deliver a drug. Uh, Paul Lonzer and Russ uh, uh, have, so Russ Lonzer and Paul Larson, both of them have 10 years experience each in this technique. And what we've done is that we, we, we decided to put together a neurosurgical planning committee. So Dr. Jan Vesper will be the chair. Russ and Paul will be one of the participants as well as Stan. And what they'll do for each patient, particularly the, the first cohort, each patient will have pre-planning surgery by these neurosurgeons. In coming up, what would be the right trajectory? How would you put, you know, what, how many uh, burr holes would you put in the brain? I mean, in the skull. And these burr holes are about four millimeters in diameter, which are really tiny. Yeah. Um, or do you just put one small hole and put all three catheters three through? So it depends on the patient's skull shape and their brain, and there's a lot of factors there. So they're going to do this in the cloud uh, um, and come up with a standardized way of approaching this. Now, we also have six ad hoc members 
who have had done deep brain stimulation at some of these other hospitals and, and, and centers where they're non-surgical. We hope to bring them on as surgical centers in the near future too, once, once we expand the trial. So we have a plan to standardize the procedure uh, for, a, for uh, gene therapy delivery in these, in, for Huntington's. I mean, as you know, Parkinson's disease, they are delivering that in a, in a different way. They're go, using a posterior approach. Uh, and that is because Parkinson's disease have a very different neuroanatomy than Huntington's. The, the, the posterior horizontal and lateral ventricles are much larger in Huntington's patients than Parkinson's. So you really can't, you, I guess you could go through the, the back of this, uh, the head to deliver, but it makes it very difficult, if not impossible, to uh, inject the head of the caudate, which is really one of the primary structures involved in neuropathology. So yes, to answer your question, I was long-winded, <laughs> but we have a, we are standardizing the procedure, and uh, in the beginning, we're going to, you know, kind of work out all the technical details, particularly this MRI guided. Um, so we're using MRIs in the operating room. I believe that's the safest way to go initially. Will we need it in the future? Probably not, because they're not using that with deep brain stimulation, even with chemotherapy. They're just doing, they do an MRI, they do the pre-planning, they have a robot that puts it in, and then you're done. But for this first clinical trial, I want to be very conservative and make sure these neurosurgeons um, publish on it, come up with a standardized procedure, uh, a manual and a training program, so that in the future when this, this is large scale, particularly when we go to Europe, is that we're, we're not going to be worried about the neurosurgical part. Awesome. Thank you. Sure. You could have just said... Uh... Yes, it's safe, Joe. Yeah, you know, a lot of thought went into that. I mean, a lot, uh, I mean, working with neurosurgeons, I mean, you know, they're some of the most highly trained doctors in, in, in any specialty. Uh, and, you know, they, they, they tend to believe their way is the right way. Um, but getting these neurosurgeons together, they really have communicated well. Uh, they really are dedicated to getting this right. They knew, do know this is cutting edge. Uh, and at this first trial is really important in uh, causing widespread adoption. And they do believe that this technique is not only applicable to uh, AAV, what we're doing, other AAV therapies, other gene therapies, chemotherapy, et cetera. So, and their safety record to date has been, there have been no patients that have any, any adverse effects through this procedure. Uh, and that includes the anesthesia. Uh, the anesthesia uh, techniques they use um, are, are have been worked out well. Uh, there's been no side effects uh, to date. Super. Adverse effects to the anesthesia, let's put it that way. Um, I think we have another question coming in, but just before uh, Hannah's finished typing it. Um, so you mentioned the allele-specific treatment, and this what this treatment that you guys have got is going to just knock both of them down. Um, just out of curiosity, because I'm not familiar with that, but um, has anyone else knocked both um, of them down in their studies, and has that affected, yeah. has that shown so, the effect? Yeah, we do know there are rare individuals that actually have a deletion of one of the Huntington's genes, and they're completely normal. So I think um, probably knocking it down 50%, I mean, you're talking about the whole entire body. Yeah. Okay. Now, we're not knocking it down in the whole body. We expect to knock it down, seven, you know, with high, the high dose, 75% in the deep gray, and then 50% in the cortex, and the lower dose, 50% in, in the striatum, and 25% in the cortex. Okay. That's not the whole entire body, right? That's the brain. So I, I think um, we're being conservative, but of course, we don't want to see a curve going down. All of a sudden, we inject. Um, we want to make sure it's safe and that if we start to plummet the Huntington uh, protein in the CSF down to zero, which I find very, very hard to believe. I, I, if that happened, I would be shocked because none of our animal data shows that. So, uh, but we're, that's why we're doing the escalating dose. Mm -hmm. uh, so the high dose, I mean, we start to get the 75% knockout in the striatum and 50% in the cortex. I do think what's going to probably happen with the CSF, and we do have some data to support this, at least in the mini pig, is that the CSF is going to be um, reflective of cortical 
lowering or spinal cord lowering uh, in, in people. All right, so the CSF, when we look at it, we're going, okay, what did we knock down here and is that reflective of? So we know in pigs uh, and also in other animal models, when we do brain, brain punch biopsies or neck, at, at, at autopsy, we do know there's a correlation between cortical lowering as well as deep brain lowering in the CSF. And we know that for a fact because we know exactly we're injecting this drug. Um, rather than injecting a lumbar region where you're not quite sure where that's going, uh, at least in an adult human being, I mean, you know where it's going in a monkey and an infant because they're smaller. <coughs> but an adult, you may not know exactly that that's reflective of cortical or spinal cord lowering. So this mutant CSF protein is really a surrogate for brain lowering. And we're fairly confident that if we get brain, we get CSF lowering, it's mainly going to be reflective of the cortex rather than the striatum. Super. Um, and just to clarify, there's going to be 26 patients on the first phase one, phase two study, correct? Yes, that's correct, in total, yeah. In over three sites, yeah? Um, no, six sites. So it'll be three surgical. Three surgical. And then three yeah. non-surgical. But there's six sites in total. So those three surgical sites are both going to recruit patients and have the surgery done right there. And the three other sites are going to refer into the surgical sites. Super. But we have the other three sites. They're called non-surgical. I mean, they're, they're all set to become surgical, mm -hmm. except that the neurosurgeons there are not as experienced in uh, delivering AAV. So the the surgeons that we've chosen actually have delivered AAV to the brain before, as well as deep brain stimulation and chemotherapy. So those other surgeons, the other three sites are going to be part of the ad hoc committee uh, and be brought on as soon as you know everyone feels comfortable, they're able to do it. Excellent. It's very exciting. Yeah, I know. It's, it's been a, a long time. I mean, Pavlina has been working on this for almost seven years. and. Um, it's good to see that all that hard work is really now paid off with an FDA uh, approved approval to go ahead with the clinical trial. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, any more questions coming in? I don't think so at the moment. Um, but uh, again, from myself, just as someone who's tested positive for Huntington's uh, and is not symptomatic, it's all very exciting to see just how much is going on in general now and uh, yeah. the investment and the uh, the interest in, in Huntington's and actually this is very, very serious uh, treatments coming through here. Yeah. Um, so it's very, very exciting for all of us. Yeah, you know, I think we're beyond the stage with Huntington's where you know, we know a lot about the disease mm -hmm. and this may seem like it's very invasive, but when it really comes down to it, what, what's nice from my perspective is I've seen gene therapy uh, evolved since the 1990s when I was at NIH. I've also seen uh, neuroimaging evolve over the last uh, almost 30 years. And also just the materials that these catheters are made of, it's just incredible that you can make a catheter the size of a human hair, which is a dream I think that Ed Oilfield had, had back in the 1990s. So it's all converged to this, this time point here in history where all of these things are possible. I mean, you can take the brain and spin it around in an OR and look at it in three dimensions. You could not do that before. So it's not only the molecular neurobiology that's important, but it's also the other techniques that have come, you know, come together uh, to make this protocol possible. So it's really exciting for me to see that all come together. Excellent. And just to clarify, so you're hoping to start at the end of this year sometime. No, no. Well, well, we hope to enroll as soon as possible. We hope to actually dose uh, soon after the second half. Okay. And the how long will that first phase one, phase two take? Do you think? You so we so we have eighteen months slated. Realistically, we hope to have safety data by the end of twenty nineteen. Yeah. Okay. By mid twenty twenty, we hope to have some kind of efficacy signal. And by the end of 2020, we hope to be going to the FDA with results. But uh, there's no way to predict that. Yeah. And that's a forward-looking statement, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got it. No worries. <laughs> um, and I think... then, so, Joe, hopefully by the time our first Young Adults Congress in May 2020 comes along, we'll have another update from you that we'll be able to find out how... So. 2019 will have come have come along with the recruitment and also the dosing. 
Yes. So yes. That's exciting clinical data, that would be great. Yeah. Um, so that's why, I mean, that's why people who are listening to this, that's why we really wanted to enrich. I know that there's been, I've received some criticism about the enrichment, but you know, you try to do the best for, for the study from the scientific integrity of the study. You try to uh, make it so that you can get the results as soon as possible so you can open up the trial to more individuals. And I think that's an important message. It's not that we're excluding people. Um, of course, if we could design a study, include everybody, we would. But this is really about looking very carefully at individuals who we think are going to progress faster and get the answer sooner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I think uh, I speak for a lot of people in saying that the the kind of treatment isn't really invasive. If, if it does the job of stopping Huntington's or slowing it, then people will happily go for that, I think, uh, over having Huntington's itself, of course, which is... Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the things I should mention is that the, the surgery, you, you will get a haircut. And I and, for free, yeah, for free. <laughs> so one of the, one of the things is that um, I hadn't realized is that it has nothing to do with the size of the hole because I've scrubbed in on these procedures with uh, Paul Larson at UCSF. They put a radio opaque grid, and that means that you can see it on MRI, and the grid goes on both sides of the skull, and it's simply this: they have to shave your head or part of your head so that the grid will stick on the on the skin. <laughs> That, that, it's as simple as that. That's as simple as that. So, um, you know, that, that that's part of it. And that, that's really the only reason. Well, if, if I ever have this treatment, then, Joe, I'll, I'll make sure I have long hair when I go so I can get my hair cut at the same time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, once again, thank you very much, Joe. That was a very good uh, explanation of what Unico was up to. It's very, very exciting. Um, and we appreciate you coming on. And that's all. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for, for watching as well. And, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, if you've got any questions that haven't been answered on this, then feel free to email info at HDO, and we can pass them along to Joe. Thank you, folks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.